everyone, this is Music Tech Help Guy. I'm doing something a bit different in this video. I want to talk about why I've switched over to Studio One for mastering, and I'll also give you an overview of the mastering features in Studio One. By the way, if you want a more in-depth look at Studio One, I have full courses on mixing, recording and editing, MIDI, and mastering in Studio One, and they're over at ask.video and macprovideo.com. So the main reason why I switched over to Studio One for mastering is not just because I love its features, it was kind of out of necessity. Most of you guys know me as a hardcore Logic user. Logic has been my main DAW choice for probably the last 10 years, if not longer. I do use Pro Tools quite a bit for tracking in the studio and doing some editing work. I dabble with Cubase a bit here and there. But back in the days of Logic 9 and Logic 8, I would buy the full studio version of Logic, and it'd come in this big box set with a bunch of installation discs, and one of the programs that came with Logic was called WaveBurner. Now, WaveBurner is basically extinct now. The last update to it was back in 2009, but I loved WaveBurner because it had all of the same plugins that Logic had, plus you could load in your third-party plugins as well, but you could import all of the mixed songs on a project and apply different plugins to each, apply global plugins to everything in the project. So it was really nice for CD mastering and CD authoring. Now, I'm not doing much CD mastering these days, but for album or EP mastering, it's still really nice to be able to master a whole project as a unit and apply proper trimming, fading, and adjust the gaps between songs. And now that Logic 10 has been out for a while, WaveBurner seems to have been abandoned, and although you can master right within Logic's arrange window, it just doesn't seem particularly suited for mastering work, nor does really any arrange area in any DAW for that matter. So getting back to Studio One, in Studio One, there's two types of projects you can work with. You can create a new song, and you can create a new project. Song files are your typical multi-track projects where you can record, mix, and edit while project files are specifically meant for mastering multiple songs together. So in Studio One projects, you can load in your pre-mastered mixes down here. I've got three different songs in here. And what you can also do down here is you can trim and fade these things. So you can just trim up the end of a song. You can add a fade. You can adjust the curve of the fade as well. And you can also adjust the placement of the tracks next to each other. Now, one of the things that I love that you can do here is you can also adjust where the actual track marker is. So if I want to pull back this track so it's a little bit further away from the previous track and then set a track marker, you can do that. One of my very first real jobs in audio was mastering concert recordings to CD for Central Michigan University's School of Music. So I'd probably master 8 to 12 live concerts every week in a busy week, that is. And when I was doing this, the ability to add a new track marker right in the middle of a recording was a really nice feature to have, especially for multi-movement works where you want to split up a long musical work into multiple movements, but have each of those movements be on separate tracks on the CD. This still applies for digital releases as well. So editing mastering projects is very different than mixing projects. It's all about making sure you have a big enough gap between the songs and a small gap at the front end of the beginning of songs, like right here. So you don't want it too long, but you don't want it too short either. So the way I've always done this is I play the tail end of one song and I count to three once the audio is more or less imperceptible. One, two, three. And right on three is where I want the next track to play. So for this example, I could pull this track forward a bit. One, two, three. So it's not a perfect process, and it changes a bit from track to track. It's all about feel for me. If a softer song is ending on a long ambient fade out, I might give it a bit more time before the next song comes in. Now that's just editing. Studio One projects have this awesome integrated spectrum analyzer with eight different modes that you can pick from. 
So they've got waterfall, sonograph, segments, curve, 12th octave, or it's basically semitones, third octave, and octave. I prefer the FFT mode because it gives you this slanted white line, which is essentially a pink noise reference. It's a very rough reference, but it gives you a frequency reference to follow. So in this song, I could probably use a bit more high end and a bit more fundamental bass. Again, it's not a perfect frequency reference, but it's a nice quick way to gauge the frequency balance in your project. There's also some meters down here for volume and loudness. I prefer the EBU 128 meter because it shows you your integrated loudness on top here, and then it shows you your short-term loudness on the bottom. With the rest of these meters, it just shows you left and right balance. You can view this in LUFS or LU mode, I prefer viewing this in LUFS, and the orange box shows you your loudness range, so like the dynamic range of the loudness. So these are all really important meters to pay attention to when you're adding and working with your master limiter. And then there's also a phase meter over here with a correlation meter on the bottom. Remember, you want the correlation to be above zero. So if this is moving to the right of zero, you're good. If it's dropping below zero a bunch and moving to the left too much, it means you've got some major phase cancellation issues in your mix. Or you might just be overdoing it with imaging plugins. Speaking of plugins, you can select each of the individual tracks up here, and you can apply inserts to the individual tracks, or you can add inserts to the entire master project. So there's two different areas here where you can add effects. For the master inserts, there's actually two different areas down here too. There's the inserts area and the post area. The master inserts come before this fader and the post inserts come after the master fader. Now, most of the time when I'm mastering, I'm leaving my master fader alone. I'm just leaving it fully open at zero dB, and I'm usually doing the same um, with the track faders. I'm keeping it at zero dB, or unity, as it's called. Um, there really isn't a reason for me to adjust the track faders unless there's one track that's just too loud um, in comparison to the others. But another thing you can do is you can actually pull down the track gain here of each region. So typically, I'll adjust the gain of the region, not the track fader itself, because I'm pretty sure the inserts on the track here come before the track fader, not after. So for example, I could change up the EQ settings on each of these individual tracks using the track inserts or whatever other plugins I wanted to add here. Uh, one problem I always have is certain songs being too wide and other songs being too narrow. So I can go in and use a mid-side processing EQ to accentuate certain songs to make them a bit wider on the sides. And then I could take other songs and I can make them a little bit more center and tame the sides. So for my master signal chain here, it's not really any different in Studio One than it would be in Logic. So it's not really about the plugins. I, I love using Gullfoss as my mastering EQ. Sometimes I'll put Gullfoss on the individual channels rather than on the master. So each song can have its own custom setting. Um, and then usually I'll add Ozone 8. In particular, I like the dynamic EQ because it allows you to boost or attenuate variably on these bands so you're not just doing a hard cut. So it ends up being a softer, uh, better blended effect for mastering. I really like their tape emulation if you're just trying to warm up a track. The exciter is really cool if you want to uh, add some presence uh, to different bands. It's a multi-band exciter. So it's, it's, uh, it's split into four different bands. And then probably my favorite uh, module within Ozone is the imager. It's a four band uh, imager, it's a multi-band imager. I'm not a big fan of Ozone's vintage limiter or maximizer. So I typically go with the FabFilter Pro L after that as my master brick wall limiter. So again, as you can see, I'm using all third party plugins anyway. So it's not about the plugins in Studio One. It never has been. It's about the functionality of the interface. So I'm often using hardware along with third-party plugins to master. And under the Personas uh, category of plugins here, under their stock plugins, there's a plugin called Pipeline, Pipeline Stereo here. And what you can do is you can place this either on the master or even on the individual, uh, the individual tracks. And what the pipeline does is 
it acts like the IO plugin in Logic. It's essentially an effects send and effects return. So you set what output you want to send your effects on, and then you choose what input you want um, to return that on. So what you can do is you can add this uh, before, after, or in between your master inserts here, send the signal out of your interface, out of Studio One, uh, patch it up to what, whatever hardware chain you wanna use, and then patch it back into Studio One uh, via the inputs, the line inputs on your audio interface. So that's the uh, the pipeline plugin. Um, like I said, it's pretty much the same thing as the IO plugin in Logic, uh, but there's one little cool thing here that I love is this mix blend. So this allows you to mix blend your hardware. So you can actually get a wet and dry signal and just blend in your hardware um, into uh, your, your final master. So I find this uh, plugin incredibly helpful for... Uh, for uh, a hybrid workflow like this where I'm using some hardware and I'm using some uh, plugins. Another crazy useful feature in Studio One is if you click right here, either on the individual tracks or on the master, this will open the editor, and then you can click here, and it opens up the routing view. And what this does is it allows you to break out a channel or break out the master channel onto this sort of like signal flow environment. And what's cool is there's this splitter tool. And what the splitter will do is it will split the signal on a particular channel. Now, there's three different split modes. There's normal, channel split, and frequency split. Let's check out the frequency split. So right now, this is just two splits. Let's set this to four. So imagine this breaking up the signal chain into low, mid-low, mid-high, and high frequencies and you can adjust the cross fade or cross blend of, or of each of these channels here. So what you can do is just right here now, it's just gonna control the sub lows below 179 hertz. And then this is gonna control just the 179 to 772 range. This is gonna control the level of 772 to 2.94. And then this is gonna control the air above 2.94. Let me put that up a little higher. So this is truly like an air control. This is like a mid-high control. And this is truly a sub control. So you can actually mute these too. If I just want to hear the low end, I can just mute everything except for the bottom band here. So this isn't just simply a volume control for these either. You can add inv individual plugins to each of these split signal chains. So if I go to my inserts here, maybe I just want to add a bit of compression to just the low frequency band, maybe to just control the, uh, the, control the bass a bit more. You could do that as well. Um, if I wanted to maybe add some stereo width or something to the high band, I could add a stereo spread just to that frequency band. So this gives you a lot of control over what plugins you can add, but not but where you can add them in the signal chain, but again, allows you to split things up into different frequency ranges. Another really cool use for this is if you want to do some um, mid-side processing. So for example, I'll throw the splitter back on here. This time I'll use the, the, the channel split. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add this plugin called the Mix Tool. It's a stock plugin. And in the Mix Tool, I'm going to set this to mid-side transform. So essentially what this is doing is it's, com it's converting left and right to mid-side. So what I have instead of left and right here in the splitter is mid and side. So what I can do is I can effectively pull down the sides, pull up the sides, pull down the mids, pull down, uh, pull up the mids, the center. But, but notice that we're getting some left and right stereo effects. That's because we haven't converted the mid side back to stereo. So what you do is you add another mix tool plugin to the end of the signal chain. And on this one, you turn on um, mid-side transform again. So essentially it's converting it to mid-side here. 
it's processing it as mid and side on these two different channels and then converting mid side back to uh, left and right stereo. So if I play around with the splitter now, yeah, that's just the side control here. And then this is just the mid or center control. So another really cool thing that you can do with this is you can create these really cool complex parallel signal chains. So I've got the mix tool here that's just converting the mid side. I've got a splitter on channel split mode, splitting this to center or mid here and side here. So I've just got the uh, API 2500, just compressing uh, the center a bit and just giving it some glue. Then I've got the Kush Clairphonic, giving the high end a bit more air and diffusion. Then I've got the mix tool again, converting back to left and right stereo. Then I've got a second splitter that's in frequency split mode with three splits. On the low end, I've got the Ozone uh, Vintage Compressor, just controlling the low end a bit. The mid range, I've got the Exciter, just giving the mid range uh, a bit of uh, tape saturation. And then I've got uh, Gulfos as my uh, master EQ, just helping balance some things out. I've got the Ozone Imager, just giving uh, some, um, some width uh, to the different frequency ranges. And then finally, the uh, Pro-L as my master limiter. So one thing you can do is when you have, even with a complex signal chain like this, if you click this insert bypass over here, it bypasses everything. So with the original mix, it was kind of narrow sounding and small sounding. It was very precise, which was good. I could hear every little transient, every kick, every snare sound, but it was very narrow and small sounding. And yes, I know, I know, I need to volume match things for a proper comparison, but if you just take it down to tonally, the original was a good mix, it's just kind of narrow sounding, and after all this mastering, splitting this thing up into mid-side, uh, doing some mid-side processing, splitting up the frequency range, and exciting things in different ways, it makes the whole master sound much more live sounding, much more full uh, sounding, much more exciting sounding too. The A narrow mix is nice because you can hear everything and it may be very precise, but it doesn't really have any like vibe to it. It doesn't have as much energy to it. And if you're using hardware, you can throw that pipeline plugin in here wherever you want in the signal chain. So if I wanted the pipeline to go here, or if I wanted it to go here, um, I could add it in and add in my hardware processing in this signal chain as well. So yeah, this pretty much wraps up the video too. This is why I love using Studio One for mastering now. Like I said, it's not about the plugins, it's just about the functionality, it's about the interface. All right guys, so that's pretty much it for this overview. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, this is in no way a full tutorial on mastering in Studio One. It's essentially just my um, off the cuff thoughts about mastering in Studio One and why I've switched over. Um, if you wanna learn more about Studio One, whether it be recording, editing, MIDI, mixing, mastering, I've got several courses over at ask.video and macprovideo.com where you can check those out. Hope you guys enjoyed today's video and thanks for watching.